Okay, good afternoon everyone from the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Dave Lamarier, uh, but I'm appearing to you on your screen on the, on the webpage as uh, Ashley Fortune Isham, uh, because I'm using her account. <laughs> so, uh, but I'd like to welcome you to our webinary, webinar, webinar series held in partnership with the USGS's uh, National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center which I will fumble through uh, the abbreviation of NCCWSC uh, several times, I'm sure. Um, and they're located in Reston, West, uh, Reston Virginia. Uh, the NCCWSC Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series uh, highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and adaptations and aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts of fish and wildlife. Um, so at this point, I will turn things over to Emily Fort, the uh, Data and Information Coordinator from the NCCWSC, uh, to introduce today's speaker. Emily? Thanks so much, and I want to thank all of you guys for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm proud to introduce Jennifer Cartwright. She's a biologist at the Tennessee Water Science Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Her research interests include soil science, terrestrial microbial ecology, and GIS. She recently defended her doctoral dissertation in biology at Tennessee State University and will graduate this May. Um, a portion of this talk will also be presented by Bill Wolf, who is a hydrologist and the assistant director for surface water studies at the Tennessee Water Science Center. Jennifer, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks to both of you. Um, so my name is Jennifer Cartwright and I'll be presenting with Bill Wolf. Both of us are from the Tennessee Water Science Center in Nashville, Tennessee, and we will be talking about climate-sensitive insular ecosystems of the southeastern U.S. First, a few acknowledgments. This research was funded by the Southeast Climate Science Center, and we collaborated with colleagues at NatureServe and at North Carolina State University. Some of the field work that I'll be discussing and Bill will be discussing at the end of the presentation happened at the Arnold Engineering Development Complex and at Stones River National Battlefield, which is managed by the National Park Service, both in Tennessee. And some of the lab work was conducted at Tennessee State University. So to start, I'd like to give you a, our working definition of insular ecosystems. What do we mean when we say insular ecosystems? Uh, we have three criteria for our working definition. First of all, these are systems that have individual occurrences which are spatially discrete. So in the lower left, um, you see an, an aerial image of two Carolina bays. And you can see how metaphorically we could think of them as islands surrounded by a contrasting ecosystem. So they are spatially discrete rather than continuous ecosystem uh, occurrences. Secondly, these systems tend to have relatively small geographic footprints. We're typically talking about um, land area that is much less than 1% of the uh, total land area of the regions in which these systems occur. And thirdly, these insular systems have steep ecological and environmental gradients at their boundaries. And at the lower right, you see an image of a rock outcrop ecosystem at its boundary with the surrounding pine forest, and you can see what I mean by um, <clears throat> a steep ecological or environmental gradient. So that's sort of our working definition of what we mean by insular ecosystem. Our project was that we focused on a set of insular ecosystems in the southeast US, and we reviewed the existing literature on these uh, systems in order to, first of all, evaluate their biodiversity contributions, both to global and regional biodiversity. We also wanted to assess the current threats to ecosystem integrity, which are uh, documented in the literature on these systems. <clears throat> and finally, we wanted to develop a framework for future re uh, research on uh, the climate change vulnerability of these systems. So the insular, insular ecosystems we review fall into a few categories. We looked at rock outcrop ecosystems, grassland and woodland systems, and wetland and riparian systems. Some of the rock outcrop ecosystems we looked at included granite outcrops of the Piedmont. This is an image from South Carolina, but a lot of these granite outcrops are clustered in Georgia, actually. And as you can see, they have 
uh, subtle depressions within them <clears throat> that uh, sustain unique assemblages of uh, plant species. We looked at high elevation Appalachian outcrops. Um, these are often uh, subjected to uh, cloud cover and um, immersion in fog. We looked at limestone cedar glades, and toward the end of the presentation, I'll be talking about some of my field research in uh, limestone cedar glades within the central basin of Tennessee. That's another rock outcrop system. We looked at uh, grassland and woodland systems, including mid-Appalachian shale barrens. These can have anywhere from an almost open canopy to a almost totally closed canopy, typically steep slopes and the soil surface uh, uh, covered with shale fragments. We looked at xeric limestone prairies. These are sort of a cousin to uh, limestone cedar glades, but they have some <clears throat> geographic and topographic differences uh, that I can discuss if anyone's interested in. And we looked at uh, high elevation uh, Appalachian balds, both grassy balds, so you can see an example on the left, and heath balds on the right, and both of these uh, at high elevations gradate into a uh, rock outcrop ecosystem. We looked at some wetland and riparian systems, including Carolina bays, and you saw at the start of the presentation that aerial image, um, Car Carolina bays are often um, elliptical depressions that are uh, geographically isolated wetlands in the coastal plain. We looked at karst depression wetlands, and my colleague Bill Wolf would, will be discussing some of his research at the end of the presentation in um, a karst depression wetland on the highland rim of Tennessee known as Sinking Pond. And finally, we looked at river scour ecosystems, which occur along the banks of high gradient reaches of large rivers and um, are subjected to and have their ecosystem integrity maintained largely by periodic uh, scouring from uh, large flood events. So here is a map of the general distribution of these uh, insular ecosystems that we looked at. And you can see that they cover a number of different um, physiographic provinces throughout the southeast, including the coastal plain, the Piedmont, the interior lo low plateau, the mid and southern Appalachian region, um, and the Ozarks, among others. And I should, I should say that there are a number of other systems within the southeast that would meet our criteria um, for being defined as insular systems. Um, we didn't try to look at all of them. We tried to pick a representative uh, sample. But some others um, that would also meet our definition include peat systems like bogs and fens. Uh, cliff ecosystems, these may be considered linear uh, ecosystems, but if you zoom out at a, at a larger geographic scale, they could also be considered insular systems. Um, within peninsular Florida, there are a number of systems that could be considered insular, including cypress domes. And then um, ephemeral ponds, these are sometimes known in the Northeast, they're often known as vernal pools. So that's just to say that there are a number of other uh, systems within the southeast U.S. and beyond that meet our working definition for insular systems. So why are these insular systems special, or why were we interested in reviewing the literature on them? Well, first of all, they represent fragmented habitat. And we tend to think of habitat fragmentation as a phenomenon associated with land use change. But we can think of these insular systems as a sort of naturally fragmented habitat. And that lends itself to studies of island biogeography. Um, I won't get into that within the talk, but if anyone has questions, we can discuss that at the end. Um, an important feature is that the geographic locations of these insular systems are often geophysically determined and constrained. So for example, if we're thinking about a karst depression wetland, that wetland ecosystem, its spatial location is uh, determined by the geomorphology of the karst depression in, in which it occurs. We could also say that about um, high elevation outcrops at, at the tops of mountains, where um, 
there's a geomorphic or geophysical um, constraint on the location of that ecosystem. A little later, I'll be talking about how these systems are typically maintained by characteristic stress or disturbance regimes and how that is important when we start to think about climate change. Um, but right now, I'd like to talk about uh, another reason why these systems are special is that they often contribute disproportionately to biodiversity, both uh, regional biodiversity and global biodiversity. So to start with, I wanted to show you this map, which is courtesy of NatureServe. It's um, hot spots of rarity weighted richness for G1 and G2 species in the US. So this is globally critically imperiled and globally imperiled species. And we can see that there are a few hot spots for uh, rare species richness. One is coastal California and uh, the desert southwest of California. Another is the big island of Hawaii. And uh, another is the southeastern US. And if we look within the southeast, we can see that um, some areas of the interior low plateau, some areas of the mid and southern Appalachians, um, a zone within the coastal plain, and then several regions within the Florida Panhandle and Peninsular Florida are all hot spots of rare species uh, richness within the US. This is a map from Estill and Cruzon of centers of plant endemism within the southeastern US. And we see a few similar patterns of uh, plant endemism being clustered in the central basin of Tennessee um, in, within the southern Appalachian region, um, the mid-Atlantic mid coastal plain, and then certainly within the uh, panhandle and peninsular Florida. So we, we wanted to uh, think about what, in what ways the insular systems that we were studying might be contributing to regional and global biodiversity. And one of those uh, mechanisms is by sheltering endemic species. So endemics are found only within uh, the particular insular ecosystems in question or, or closely related context. So here are four examples. Um, the maps to the right of the photographs for each have in green the states in which the particular species occurs, and in yellow, the individual counties where the species occurs. Um, in the upper left is the pool sprite, which is endemic to Piedmont granite outcrop. Um, in the upper right, we see the shale barren rock crest. So in some cases, just the name of the species gives you a clue that it is endemic to one of these uh, insular systems, in this case, shale barren. <coughs> Excuse me. In the lower left, we see the Cumberland rosemary which is endemic to river scour systems on the Cumberland Plateau. And um, on the lower right, we see the spreading avens, which is endemic to high elevation um, southern Appalachian outcrop. So in all of these cases, we see species that have um, relatively restricted geographic ranges and occur um, only within these insular ecosystems. So they contribute both to uh, regional and to global biodiversity because they're not found uh, really anywhere else. Another type of biodiversity contribution comes from biogeographic disjunction. So uh, these are cases where a species may be secure within its range elsewhere outside of the southeast U.S., but is disjunct to a particular um, uh, insular ecosystem, meaning that it is uh, geographically separated from its home range elsewhere. So on the left, we see an example in the northern bent grass, uh, which has ranges in northern New England and in the Rocky Mountains, and is disjunct to high elevation outcrops within the Appalachian region. And on the right, we see Wright's cliff break, which is um, disjunct from the arid southwest to uh, granite outcrops of the Piedmont. So this is a form of biodiversity contribution uh, to not necessarily to global biodiversity, but to regional biodiversity. So we tried to do a quantitative assessment of the biodiversity contributions um, for these, uh, this select group of insular ecosystems. So here you see 
numbers of globally rare taxa. So this is G1 through G3 uh, species. And we can see that all of the insular systems that we looked at harbor at least a few globally rare taxa. And some of them, uh, such as limestone cedar glades, Piedmont uh, outcrops, Syric limestone prairies, high elevation systems, Carolina bays, and river scour systems all harbor more than 20 globally rare taxa. We looked at globally rare plant associations. And again, we see that all of the systems we looked at harbor at least a few globally rare associations. And uh, we see that xeric limestone prairies and river scour systems both harbor more than 20 globally rare plant associations. So the conclusions from our um, assessment of biodiversity contributions first are that all of the insula insular ecosystems we examined uh, harbor at least a few rare endemic and or disjunct species. And many of them sustain rare associations um, and or high levels of taxonomic richness. And these biodiversity contributions are really disproportionate to geographic area. Again, we're typically talking about uh, systems that cover much less than 1% of the land area of the regions in which these systems occur. And again, there are a number of other insular ecosystems that we didn't examine in detail, uh, which we know also support endemic and disjunct species as well. These include Appalachian bog, um, a number of systems within peninsular Florida, such as uh, Sandhill Scrub Island, sandstone rock houses of the interior low plateau, coastal plain pocosins, which <clears throat> can gradate into uh, Carolina bays in some cases, Chattooga Basin spray cliffs, and a number of others. So the next uh, assessment we made was of what are the current, uh, current threats or currently recognized threats within the literature on these ecosystems. Um, these range from physical destruction, from recreation, um, to invasive species. In the upper right, you see the Chinese privet and um, some folks attempting to remove this invasive species in the uh, lower left, you see an aerial image of a Carolina Bay that has been ditched and drained and converted to agriculture. And in the lower right is a photo of the Bluestone Dam on the New River in West Virginia, which has been specifically implicated in um, ecosystem degradation of ri river scour ecosystems uh, downstream on the New River. So. What we did was we uh, did a literature search, and we looked for any mention we could find of ecosystem threats for these insular ecosystems. And then we compiled all of these threat references by threat category. And we came up with a little more than 450 total uh, references to, to threats. And this is uh, how they broke down for all ecosystems put together. Um, the major categories of uh, references that we found in the literature to threats to these ecosystems included land use change, um, hydrologic alteration, invasive species, resource extraction, woody encroachment from uh, disturbance suppression, and then pollution and uh, physical destruction from recreation. And you'll see that climate change accounted for 4% of the references we found. I'll come back to that figure in, in a bit. But I wanted to show you the breakdown uh, by ecosystem category. Here we have rock outcrop ecosystems. And we see that um, the main threat references within the literature um, include recreation, invasive species, development, quarrying, and pollution. For wetland systems, um, direct and indirect hydrologic alteration uh, were uh, the major recognized threats within the literature, um, as well as agriculture, logging, and development. For grassland and woodland systems, overwhelmingly, we saw woody encroachment from disturbance suppression as the most often cited uh, threat to these systems, followed by invasive species. And for river scour systems, 
um, hydrologic alteration, followed by woody encroachment from disturbance suppression, invasive species development, and pollution were the most um, often cited threats within the literature. So that gets us back to this question of what about references to climate change? So of all of the threat references that we compiled, which is about 450, um, only 4% of those were references to climate change. Now, some of these papers were published before the era in which climate change was recognized as a scientific consensus. So we tried limiting our analysis only to papers published after 1995. That got it down to about 300 papers. And still, climate change accounted for only 6% of the threat references that we could find. And furthermore, of those uh, 17 references to climate change, a little more than a third of them presented no new empirical research. So these were um, references that were only in passing. So the authors might have said, the, the threats to this ecosystem are X, Y, Z, and climate change, and maybe said nothing else about it. So that leaves us with this question. What accounts for the absence within the literature on these insular ecosystems, um, the absence to references to climate change as a potential threat? Is that because climate change is really only a minor threat to these insular systems? Or is it possible that it's a major threat, but a hidden one? And we could certainly um, have a conversation about what might be the reasons why um, climate change might be a hidden threat in terms of the difficulty of um, conclusively demonstrating a causal link between climate change and ecosystem degradation, um, especially when it might be mediated through other more obvious threats such as invasive species. Um, so that, that is sort of an open question. Um, to get to that question uh, by zooming out a little bit, um, I'm going to attempt a, a very brief review of what we know about the ecological effects of climate change at a global level. So not just in the southeast US, but really um, a, at a global level. And I know that I am speaking to an audience of climate change scientists, so I will be very brief and not go into much detail. Um, but what do we know at a global level about the ecological effects of climate change? Well, we know that there are phenological changes happening globally. Um, and in fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, Jake Welton uh, presented with the National Phenology Network. Um, if we look at meta-analyses of spring phenophases, we see that uh, between two to four days earlier per decade um, has been documented um, in, in a number of different studies of uh, meta-analyses of uh, phenological change. And we know that this can lead to phenological asynchrony in which species respond to different seasonal cues or respond differently to the same cue. And um, consequences, ecological consequences of that can include um, the weakening of interspecific interactions, for example, predation or pollination. In some cases, uh, there have been observed population declines and even localized extinctions um, attributed to phenological asynchrony. We also know that rain shifting has been documented in most major biomes on Earth. Um, that is, rain shifting toward the poles or to higher elevations. Um, one meta-analysis of poleward migrations put it at about six kilometers per decade. And we know that as species shift, they don't necessarily all shift at the same rate. And um, those differential rates of range shifting can cause novel uh, species assemblages to arise. And in terms of range shifting, um, when this has been modeled, uh, in terms of climate change modeling and ecological effects, uh, migration ability has been a det an important determinant of projected extinction rate. And importantly, in the context of insular systems, to topographic limits on range shifting can uh, lead to range contraction. So um, a, a well-recognized 
uh, phenomenon is that of contracting mountain islands, um, where there's really a topographic limit uh, <clears throat> that prevents rain shifting. And um, we think that this, this may be applicable um, not just to high elevation systems, but to a number of the uh, geomorphically or topographically constrained uh, insular ecosystems that we examine. So the bottom line for, eco for insular systems in terms of the ecological effects from climate change, as far as we can tell, is that the simple climate envelope models of species migration are probably insufficient. And those are the models in which species simply migrate um, poleward or upslope uh, to, to track uh, the, the changing uh, temperature precipitation patterns. Those sorts of simplistic models are probably insufficient for insular uh, ecosystems, in particular because geomorphic and topographic limitations are present for that rain shifting. And um, there's a real need for us to examine the stress and disturbance regimes that govern these insular ecosystems. So what do I mean by that? Um, we have conceptualized these insular ecosystems as islands of elevated stress. And we uh, categorized five different stress regime categories. And this shows you um, some of the stress regime components and then some example ecosystems. Um, so edaphic climax um, stress regimes include thin soil, exposed bedrock, high solar irradiation, seasonally high soil surface temperatures. So we're typically talking about rock outcrop systems there. Topography and elevation um, can be components for high elevation systems, uh, steep slope, or um, the importance of aspect. Geochemistry can be a stress regime type um, where you see low levels of certain nutrients, either low or high pH, and, and in some cases, toxicity in certain plant species. Um, hydrology as a stress regime category can include widely fluctuating water availability or inundation and highly variable hydro periods. So that's the case for some of these uh, geographically isolated wetlands and for um, microhabitats within some rock outcrop systems. And then finally, disturbance um, has to do with uh, episodic and physically destructive events. So in, in grassland and woodland systems, that may be fire or grazing. In the context of river scour system, we're talking about uh, periodic flood scouring. So we developed this conceptual model of stress regime alteration um, to try to get at um, putting forward some, some hypotheses for ecological consequences of climate change. So what we see here on the x-axis is um, a trade-off between uh, competition on the one hand, uh, so that could be biotic, biological stress, and abiotic or physical stress on the other hand. <clears throat> and then on the vertical axis, we have habitat suitability. Um, so we can see that for mesic species um, that might be uh, inhabiting the ecosystems surrounding these insular systems, their habitat suitability is really highest uh, for low levels of abiotic stress in which they are able to successfully outcompete. Um, whereas for stress or disturbance adapted endemic species um, that are often uh, contributing to the biodiversity from these insular systems, their habitat suitability is greater um, at higher levels of abiotic stress. They tend to be stress adapted, uh, but relatively poor competitors. Um, so the important thing to notice here is that if you move too far in either direction along the x-axis, um, you can see that, that we could predict that there would be ecological effects. If you move uh, to the left toward greater competition, um, you could, this could be a case where uh, stress-adapted endemic species get replaced or uh, invaded upon by mesic species, whereas, um, and, and that would be a case of stress regime relaxation, whereas 
if we move too far to the right, we'd be talking about stress regime intensification, which might overwhelm the, even the stress adapt, uh, adaptations of, of the endemic species. So that's our conceptual model. And we use this model to generate hypotheses for the direction of stress regime alteration for some of these systems based on uh, three possible climate change components. Um, this included higher regional temperatures, and then um, both increased precipitation, uh, causing increased flooding, um, both that could be frequency and or intensity of flooding, and or seasonally decreased precipitation, um, which could increase the frequency and or the severity of drought. And um, for those climate change components, we were able to hypothesize the direction of stress regime alteration for these different stress regime categories, like high soil surface temperatures or low temperatures, xeric soil conditions, or saturated and inundated soil conditions, widely fluctuating hydrology, and then disturbance, either from, from fire or uh, flood scour. Just to give you a couple examples of what that hypothesis generation process looks like, um, this is a, sort of a simple example of a stress regime at, uh, at high elevations that is based on um, cold temperatures. So if in a climate change scenario we were looking at warmer temperatures for these high elevation systems, then um, we would be looking at a stress regime relaxation, a shift to the left. And we could see that that might um, increase the habitat suitability for the surrounding mesic species. And that could uh, lead to um, invasion uh, of mesic species into the habitat that had um, traditionally been uh, the domain of the, of the stress-adapted endemic species. Another example in the opposite direction of stress regime intensification, and this, this will lead directly into what my colleague Bill Wolf will be talking about in a minute um, in karst depression wetlands. Here's an example. If we had increased precipitation, um, which is increasing the frequency and severity of inundation, then this would be stress regime uh, intensification for a system in which the abiotic stress regime um, included saturation and inundation. And so here, we might see um, climate change pushing this system beyond a threshold in which even the stress-adapted species were able to cope. So this is just a couple examples of how we've been using this conceptual model to try to generate some hypotheses for how climate change might affect these insular ecosystems through the mechanism of stress regime alteration. So clearly, um, there is a need for empirical research. You know, our conceptual model can generate hypotheses for the direction, uh, either stress regime relaxation or intensification, but it really doesn't say anything about the magnitude of that change or um, spatial or temporal patterns. So to get at that, we really do need uh, better empirical research on these insular ecosystems um, to evaluate these hypotheses. And specifically, we need um, empirical characterizations of the current and historical stress and disturbance regime so that we sort of have a baseline knowing what we're working with um, as climate uh, variables change. And then secondly, we need longitudinal studies that track ecological outcomes um, and climate variables simultaneously. So that leads into two case studies that we would like to uh, discuss with you. The first is um, at Sinking Pond, which is a karst depression wetland on the Highland Rim of Tennessee. And in a minute, I'll hand this over to Bill Wolf, um, who did that research. And then after uh, he discusses that, I will uh, talk a little bit about my work in limestone cedar glades in the central basin of Tennessee. OK, over to you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, this is a study that uh, we did uh, with uh, 
a lot of cooperation from uh, the University of the South, uh, uh, John Evans down there and his students. Uh, it was uh, funded by the Air Force uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, the site sinking pond is, is about 35 hectares, hectares in area, and it's a, a, a flooded, a seasonally flooded karst depression on the eastern highland rim of Tennessee uh, on Arnold Air Force Base about uh, an hour southeast of Nashville on I-24. And uh, it's, it's significant because it contains what appears to be a globally unique uh, assemblage of overcup oak, river birch, and resurrection fern, uh, a coastal plain uh, species that are disjunct in the highland rim of, of Tennessee. The, the uh, maximum water depth during the wet season in the pond is about uh, uh, almost four meters. And uh, it, it, it stays wet long enough to leave a, a, a very distinctive uh, moss line or water mark showing the, the typical uh, wet season uh, high water elevation. Uh, a, a striking visual uh, feature of the pond is the absence of, of an understory. And the, um, the presence of mature adult trees uh, is, is evidence that recruitment and regeneration of these oaks has occurred on these sites in the past. And the absence of, a, of an understory uh, now uh, raises the question of whether there's been a, a major shift in regeneration and recruitment. Uh, the impression that something has changed is, is uh, certainly strengthened by uh, the spatial patterns of different life history states uh, in the pond. Uh, in the lower right, uh, you can see the distribution of seedlings in 2002. And, and that year, like most years, the, the pond interior was basically carpeted with overcup oak seedlings. Uh, in the opposite corner, the upper left, uh, you can see that the uh, adult trees are concentrated in the, the dark blue area uh, in the center of the plot, which uh, corresponds to deep areas with water depths greater than a meter. Um, in contrast, the uh, younger uh, life states, the saplings and seedlings, tend to be uh, highly uh, concentrated on the shallow pond margins uh, areas with less than half a meter of flooding. And uh, the, the kind of, of uh, change that might produce this pattern could be uh, increased hydro period that makes sites that formerly were uh, hospitable for recruitment and regeneration of these trees uh, now inhospitable. And, and, and that was basically the hypothesis, hypothesis the Air Force uh, asked us uh, to examine. I, I should mention that they were not looking for a climate story at all. They were concerned that some activity on the base, some management or even the industrial activity of the engineering center might be having an effect uh, on, on the, the uh, ecology of this pond. And we looked at several uh, possible factors, but in the end, the one that, uh, that was the strongest by far uh, was uh, climate change. Um, this is a, a graph illustrating a, a very well documented and, and, and widely uh, known uh, change in regional rainfall patterns of the eastern United States, uh, basically a step increase in rainfall right around the year 1970. Uh, the bars on this graph represent uh, departures from the long-term mean. The, the top graph is for the uh, U.S. as a whole. The bottom graph is for the local long-term weather station of Tullahoma, Tennessee, about 15 miles uh, from the study site. So to look in at, at whether uh, the regeneration patterns historically in that pond uh, had a, a temporal pattern that, that, that corresponded with that step increase in rainfall. We cored about um, 
four, almost 50 trees, about a 10% sample of the 2.3 hectare uh, study plot I showed in the earlier map. And indeed, they show a, a pretty strong pattern. Before 1970, these oaks uh, regenerated and recruited successfully across the depth range of the deep and intermediate sections of the pond. And they uh, survived after being germinated fairly evenly through time. After 1970, uh, successful uh, recruitment to adulthood for these overcup oaks was restricted to the pond bound, uh, the shallow pond margins with uh, depths of less than half a meter. To further examine whether whether rainfall changes really were driving these patterns, we, we developed a, a simple uh, hydrologic model and, uh, that runs uh, from rainfall and temperature records, and, and that allowed us to simulate a, um, a time series of daily pond stage uh, going back to the uh, mid 1850s. Uh, in turn, having a simulated uh, daily hydrograph uh, for the pond let us examine uh, inundation events of various durations and elevations. Uh, this graph shows uh, from 1854 through 2001 uh, the elevation uh, of area that was ponded at least 200 days in a given year. And what you see is fairly striking. Before 1970, uh, a 200-day ponding event was not rare, but it was fairly sporadic. It had a, a, a probability of about 21%, basically one year out of five. After 1970, the likelihood of such events uh, nearly triples to 56%. So, so, so that's uh, pretty strong evidence that the rainfall uh, change that we've seen across the eastern U.S. Uh, has had a, a, a significant discernible effect on the ponding dynamics of sinking pond. When we add the, 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 the tree ring age and elevation data to that graph, uh, the pattern becomes uh, pretty striking. You know, we, we see again that, that these trees have successfully recruited to adulthood and survived uh, across a range of, of uh, elevations uh, through time. Uh, until the, the constant uh, exposure to prolonged flooding uh, lasting more than half a year has forced them into the margin. And this, I think, illustrates the, the kind of um, stress response that, that Jen was talking about and the, really the limitations of um, a, an extremophile competitive strategy. These trees are very well adopted to harsh conditions. They've survived for, uh, I'm sure there were trees in here over 200 years old, uh, in a site that pretty much excluded almost all competitors. But now, because of a, a climate-driven shift in hydro period, uh, they are being driven out of this hospitable site and having to compete on the pond margins with other species. Uh, the last, uh, I guess, two points I'd like to, to make about this, uh, this case study is first that, that there was a 30-year lag between the imposition of the climate stress, the change of rainfall in 1970, and the accumulation of functional and structural changes that were sufficient to be visible and provoke a management response. And secondly, that there are many other ecosystems uh, in the eastern U.S. Uh, that live on a, a, a stress uh, margin and that, that are probably uh, experiencing similar effects right now. Jen? Thanks, Bill. So um, now I will tell you a little bit about <clears throat> some of my field research in limestone cedar glades within the central basin of Middle Tennessee. Um, so, and this, this work happened uh, 
at Stones River National Battlefield outside Murfers Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which is managed by the National Park Service. Limestone cedar glades are a type of calcareous rock outcrop system, um, so they have very shallow soil depths and um, have zonal communities of bryophytes, uh, moss, lichen, and cyanobacteria, especially in the thinnest soil microhabitat, and also have zonal communities of hydrophytic vegetation in seasonally wet depressions. There are 19 endemic vascular plant species um, in cedar glades and at least 10 disjunct species and four federally listed um, species. So they contribute to that uh, <clears throat> clustering of plant endemism within the central basin of Tennessee that we saw earlier. Um, the objectives of my research were first to characterize the abiotic stress regime of, lime, of these limestone cedar glades based on empirical measurements. And the reason that that is important um, is that within the existing literature on limestone cedar glades, there has been a lot of qualitative uh, discussions of the stress regime in terms of thin soils, um, widely fluctuating, soil water content levels on a seasonal basis and seasonally extremely high soil surface temperatures. But these components of the stress regime um, are often uh, dis discussed qualitatively and, and repeated based on references to previous um, publications, but rarely have they been accompanied by um, empirical measurements or statistical analysis. So. Um, I wanted to uh, try to do a really an empirical characterization of these um, components of the abiotic stress regime uh, to sort of get that baseline um, in the context of climate change. And then secondarily, um, to evaluate the stress regime and various soil physical and chemical properties as drivers of um, a few different ecological outcomes. Uh, so I was looking at soil respiration and at uh, soil microbial community profiles. And I'll try to explain in a second what I mean by microbial community profiles. Um, here are just some rough correlations um, for all of these uh, soil depths or depth to bedrock is on the horizontal axis. And we can see that there are um, correlations with other physical and chemical soil properties such as pH, organic matter, uh, vegetation density, and uh, particle size distribution. We have here the silt to clay ratio. Um, looking at soil water content um, distribution seasonally, uh, we see the, um, the preponderance of the dry and xeric soil conditions um, during from April through September, which is the time when our region experiences reduced precipitation and increased evapotranspiration. And, and during this time, we see um, an absence of the uh, saturated soil conditions for volumetric soil water content above uh, about 45. By contrast, in the late fall through the winter, through the early spring, we see um, a reduction in those um, xeric and dry soil conditions, and we see uh, more of the uh, saturated and inundated soil conditions. We did um, an analysis of uh, canopy coverage as a factor controlling soil surface temperatures, which is important in a system that may be experiencing uh, woody encroachment from the perimeter in terms of canopy coverage change. Um, we did that through uh, digital photography and quantified canopy coverage into five zones, and then uh, found that um, for six soil uh, points, um, canopy coverage in any of those zones was um, significantly and negatively correlated with temperature. So, you know, canopy coverage uh, cooling the soil. But those effects were lessened um, for medium and thin soil areas. Um, to where those effects were really only significant for canopy coverage toward the south and the west. 
those are just some examples of the types of empirical um, observations of the stress regime. And then looking at ecological effects um, of these abiotic stress components, um, we modeled uh, soil respiration um, observed patterns based on soil temperature, water content, organic matter content, depth to bedrock, and density of vegetation. All of those were um, variables that had explanatory power um, for patterns that we observed of soil respiration in cedar glades. And then um, we looked at determinants of soil microbial metabolic profiles. So um, I can go into more depth on these methods if anyone has questions, but um, this is a community level physiological profiling method in which the entire soil microbial community is inoculated onto specially designed plates that contain um, a sole carbon substrate in each of the wells. And um, over the course of incubation, a color change response is proportional to the community metabolism of a particular carbon substrate that's present in that well. And that gives you the ability to compare across soil samples uh, metabolic profiles of, uh, of the soil community. And then um, I also did um, some uh, plating work, a plate dilution frequency assay to get at a, a most probable number of heterotrophic culturable microbes per gram of soil. And um, found for these uh, microbial indicators um, explanatory power for depth to bedrock, so that's soil depth, soil organic matter, soil pH, water content, and density of vegetation. So the implications from some of my work in the, in the cedar glades, um, first that the empirical characterization of the stress regime is needed and, and important, as I mentioned before, to get a baseline um, as regional climate may change. And we saw that some of these uh, abiotic stress regime components, like soil water content and temperature, um, did affect ecological outcomes, such as soil respiration patterns and soil microbial ecology in cedar glades. So to get at some conclusions for this uh, literature review and our work more broadly on insular ecosystems, first, um, as I showed you, insular systems are important to regional biodiversity by harboring rare species, endemic, disjunct, uh, globally rare associations, and the like. Um, second, there are many and a diverse array of recognized threats to these ecosystems that are documented in the literature. But at this point, climate change is still largely uninvestigated in these systems. Um, we have put forward stress regime alteration as a framework uh, in order to investigate uh, possible climate-driven ecological change. And we uh, presented to you a couple case studies to illustrate some possible approaches uh, for that work. So here are some references. And we will now take your questions. So, and actually, we have a, a, a question already from uh, from Steve Young that he would like to ask uh, via the phone. So, Steve, if you could hit star six and go ahead and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good. Very uh, interesting uh, talk, and your research is really uh, exciting to see. Um, I had a question early on. You know, obviously, you're talking about insular systems, and um, so these systems that you're talking about are they? Uh, and we had kind of a discussion here on the side in the chat box. I don't know if you're reading that, but on the whole, do they make up a greater proportion of the ecosystems in general than the than the normal traditional, you know, riparian forest grasslands, or or is it somewhat of an issue of terminology? I mean. Uh, if you look across the landscape, it's easy for us to kind of generalize, you know, different systems that we work in. But I think what you're showing is that these insular systems 
are, are obviously critical, but the differences in them and the number of them actually are contributing to the, the traditional or general ecosystems that we work in. Is that true, or, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, so in terms of land area and, uh, and their sort of geographic scope, um, you know, NatureServe has this classification of uh, large patch and matrix ecosystems that might cover a lot of the, um, it, you know, in the eastern United States, uh, for a lot of forest ecosystems might be classified as large patch or matrix, uh, meaning that they are continuous across uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of square miles, so relatively large geographic areas. The insular systems that we are looking at, um, individual occurrences of them are, are very small. So, um, you know, we could be talking about um, a, a few acres uh, for an individual occurrence of, of a particular insular system. And even when they are all, all of the occurrences are added together, typically we're talking about much less than 1% of the land area of the regions in which they occur. So these would be um, small patch ecosystems according to NatureServe classifications. Okay, okay. I, I One other you question I had was, you showed a figure uh, on the um, stress that looked like one that you, was. That's your own, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I might want to talk to you at some point. I, I see your contact information. I might I want to contact you and discuss that at, at, a, at a later date. So. Um, okay. I, I'll do that offline. Uh, from Sally Sims for Bill, um, can you give additional examples of other ecosystems that might have been affected by climate change that you referred to in your last slide? No, <laughs> I, I, I don't have any any concrete examples, but I mean the um, this notion of insularity. I mean, we we back when we were doing this, we thought about sites like Sinking Pond as ecological islands, where like a geographic island is surrounded by water. If you lower the water enough, it stops being an island. If you raise the water enough, it stops being an island. So I think wetlands, uh, by definition, have you know water-adapted extremophile uh, vegetation, and probably I, I would I would look at small isolated uh, wetlands in the in the eastern U.S. as uh, as as candidates that might. Uh, be worth looking at with with a, a, a kind of an approach that that tries to combine some sort of historical you know tracking longitudinal tracking of both uh, you know plant regeneration or or, or some similar uh, expression of, of uh, population with you know hydrologic uh, reconstruction or or some other reconstruction of the stress regime. It's it's um, it's not easy to do, and we were we were lucky to have like one opportunity to to do that kind of study. But I, I think if you look hard at, at at isolated wetlands, there there may well be something there. Okay, thanks, Bill. And uh, uh, Mitchell has uh, he got I got a chat message to him, and he would like to contribute to the uh, previous discussion with Steve Young. Uh, Mitchell, hit the uh, star six and uh, go ahead and speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Hey. Um, all right. So uh, first, just want to say. Uh, more of a comment. I, I went to the University of the South, Suwannee, and um, studied at Seeking Pond during a hydrology coursework. So, was thrilled to see that on there and uh, John Evans' work. Um, my question is, is pretty general, and it's, it's more playing toward the devil's advocate. And um, you know, when we present these types of examples um, as a representation of showing, obviously, you know, the effects on insular ecosystems, um, is is it a bit of a, um, how should I word this, a, a potential 
painting ourselves into a corner in terms of speaking to the larger public about the effects of climate change um, when we're talking about just an insular system, you know, being affected, if that makes sense. Um, well, it, it does make sense, and, and, but I, I think what I, what I would, would say is that some of these systems may be uh, sort of alarm clocks or bellwethers. They, 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 they may be some of the, the places where we will see effects the earliest. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've been talking, you know, with, with botanists and biogeographers, and, and, and I, you know, there's, there's a sense uh, that this increase in rainfall in the in the eastern United States right now may be having a, a broader effect on other, uh, especially hardwoods, and and so I think that that these localized studies, uh, you know, can be used as uh, you know a basis uh, for 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 broader uh, you know geographical biogeographical analyses uh, but but the other the other thing that, that you know is a point that Jen made is that collectively these things occupy very little area and they account for a, a very uh, large amount of our, our uh, natural heritage in the eastern US and especially in the southeast and and I think from a conservation perspective they uh, form a theme that, that might be useful you know, in, 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 in looking at priorities. And just to add to what Bill was saying, a couple points. When you're, when you're thinking about the general public and communicating to the general public, like Bill was saying, um, you know, these could be the sort of canary in the coal mine ecosystems um, because, you know, those of us living in the southeast, um, the, the climate change effects that are happening at the poles uh, are well documented, but they're far away. And so uh, seeing ecological change in our own backyard, so to speak, uh, you know, might have some potential for communicating climate change impacts to the public. The second point I wanted to make is in terms of maybe not the general public, but um, conservation professionals and uh, managers, in the implications of this really have to do with how do we protect these these places that are that are clearly important to natural heritage and really necessitating a rethinking of these traditional conservation paradigms that rely on static boundaries and uh, just protecting a, a, a confined static geographic area by putting a fence around it and Excluding, um, you'd say recreation. You know, it's 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 more complicated than that if we're going to protect these systems in the context of climate change. Yeah, um, if I can still speak, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, to both your points, I, I think they're spot on. And um, I, I work uh, with Audubon uh, managing a 3,000 acre property called Strawberry Plains in North Mississippi, but. Um, it's one of those those examples where we have a very very rural community, um, and kind of what Jennifer was saying, most of their um, understanding or um, information concerned with climate change, or in many of their opinions, the lack thereof, is uh, these you know news blasts and things at the poles. And the property that 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 we manage has several vernal pools and. Um, you know, beaver created uh, ponds. We're at the headwaters of the Coldwater River. And I just wonder, you know, is, you know, an example like Sinking Pond for someone like me, um, you know, being um, a biologist is so impactful. But I, I wonder, are there other examples that you know of within the Southeast that are these insulated areas that have, you know, for us, our, our downfall is we don't have that track record of um, annual or even seasonal um, documentation of the changes that are happening, and that's something we're hoping to begin. But are there other um, insulated ecosystems that are as well known um, that you guys are aware of or, or might be um, looking to investigate? Well, uh, we, well, 
I mean, we've certainly seen a, an, an absence within the literature of that empirical link. Now, okay. for, for some systems, um, it might, the work ahead might be as simple as comparing, you know, pulling together different strands of data from, you know, observed ecological changes over time and linking those to historical records of, you know, temperature or precipitation. Um, you know, in other cases, those long-term ecological records might be harder to come by. Yeah, I mean, we're we're I, I, you know, we've been talking with with uh, Milo Pine and the guys at NatureServe of looking for long-term uh, ecological monitoring records that we might be able to link to to, to historical climate records and, and and look for associations, but. You know, I mean, if 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 um, if we've been too subtle uh, so far, I, I think what one of the main points we want to make really is that there is a desperate need uh, to collect some empirical data, both on ecological records or ecological state and uh, stress regime of of these these small systems, and and uh, like we. Uh, we're we're proposing that this concept, the stress regime concept of insularity, might be a useful framework for looking at some of these systems. Okay, I have a, a question typed in from uh, David Smith. Uh, did any of your research actually evaluate impacts of climate change on insular systems, or was it restricted to developing techniques for future analysis? Well, the, the 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 old study of at, at Sinking Pond that that I presented, I, I think, w comes as close as anything that we are aware of in in actually documenting an ecological effect of of climate change. But but the the, the main study that, that that Jen is reporting is is primarily a, a, a literature search. We've got a quick question here from Steve Young again. Um, is this work focused on extreme climate events too? Uh, so by extreme climate events, we might be talking about droughts or storm events. Is that is that the nature of the question? Um, so in, in in both of those cases, we're sort of getting at the issue of disturbance as a stress regime uh, type or factor. Um, <clears throat> if we're if we're talking about uh, say large-scale storm events that might uh, cause flooding, um, you know, in, in the case of, say, river scour systems that are primarily disturbance-maintained systems, um, changes in the frequency uh, or maybe secondarily the intensity of, of those events um, would constitute a, a change in the disturbance regime, which is part of the stress regime. And then if you're talking about, say, hydro period uh, for a geographically isolated wetland, for example, then certainly um, changes in the magnitude or the frequency of storm events, um, you know, could, could have impacts on the hydro period, which would be a form of stress regime alteration. And, you know, when you look at disturbance from fire, these days so much of that disturbance regime is managed by people in the form of either fire suppression or controlled burns. Uh, but to the degree that that disturbance from fire was uh, natural, then you could imagine that droughts, um, you know, would have an effect on, on the disturbance regime from fire. And, they, and droughts certainly would have an impact on um, stress regimes like in, in rock outcrop ecosystems that involve seasonally xeric soil conditions. Does that, answer, does that get to that question? Wait okay. Yeah, Steve says yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so uh, Leonard was having problems with his um, star six. Do you want to try it one more time, Leonard? If not, I'll read your question. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so uh, from what Leonard says, uh, he works in the Everglade Tree Islands, 
uh, small area, high biodiversity, uh, biogeochemical hotspots, uh, which is um, uh, high phosphorus in an oligotrophic wetland. Um, oops, but he didn't actually do a question here. He was going to try star six again. Um, okay, so he's finishing his question via, via the text here. Uh, how is this connected to the surrounding ecosystem? I mean, it sounds we we, we didn't uh, we didn't attempt to to uh, uh, do much in, in in Florida just because there is is so much there and and there's also a lot of work being done. But from the description, uh, those would be strongly insular systems with high gradients to the surrounding uh, you know the surrounding landscape. So I mean, it sounds it, it sounds like like very you know, fascinating, you know, field area. But but I I don't I I'm sure that that, that uh, uh, we we can't add any much insight I think probably to to somebody who's working there. Okay, sorry about the technical glitch there. Um, now we've uh, cycled back to Mitchell. He actually uh, typed in. And sorry, I had to cut you off, Mitchell. We just had so many questions uh, stacked up here. Um, his last question, um, is there any funding for research and monitoring um, from insular ecosystems, from, uh, for insular ecosystems uh, from USGS or the USDA? Well, sporadically, yes. I mean, we, you know, we, 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 had, we got funding from the Southeast Climate, Center, Climate Science Center to do this, this literature survey, but, but the way science funding works uh, a lot of times is opportunistically and incrementally. We, we have uh, this office right now has uh, uh, some work with the National Park Service uh, looking at ecological flows on, on rivers that include river scour systems and we, we have hopes to uh, expand the, the hydrologic analysis to try to quantify the flooding regime that's necessary to keep uh, these uh, boulder bars and and flat rock communities scoured, but but uh, more broadly, no. There's 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 no concerted program uh, to fund this kind of of work at a, at a national scale at this at this time. So, you know, the main thing that we hope to accomplish by this talk would be to get the ideas out there, and and to in the, in the hopes that, that other workers uh, might find or seek, you know, small opportunities to look at some of these systems through this particular lens or, or a lens similar to it. And Bill, and then I have another two-part question for you from Mary Morrison. Uh, did your work look at season of the increased rainfall? High rainfall in winter would be different what would be a different effect than high rainfall in the spring? Uh, we we were we were painting with 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 a, a pretty broad brush. I mean, we have, like I said, daily uh, simulated records, uh, and but really what we were looking at was at a, at an annual basis what kinds of of inundation uh, durations uh, limited the the recruitment and regeneration of these these oaks. Uh, basically, to give you an idea, this, this pond stays wet about half the year most years, and, it, and it's, it's called sinking pond for a reason. It, the, the water level can uh, rise or fall two or three meters in two or three days. Uh, you know, when it falls, it's closely connected to the, to the groundwater system. Uh, so, so, and and also overcup oak are uh, they're very adopted to seasonal flooding. They uh, the the oak leaves uh, drop uh, in the in the spring or, or in the summer, and they expect to be submerged, and they wait until they're exposed to air uh, to germinate. Uh, so, so the the um, the effects. The, the, the oak trees are, are basically adapted to varying seasons of, of, of flooding. Okay, Bill, and, and before I go on to Mary's uh, second part of her question, uh, David Smith is asking if there's a reference for your work at Sinking Pond. Uh, 
Yes, um, there, there, there is. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a USGS scientific investigations uh, report, and it is, it is published online, uh, and, and so I think it's in Jen's uh, reference list. There it is. Uh, there's the cover of it. So it's it's uh oh it's Water Resources Investigations Report 03-4217. And uh if you search for that you'll you'll come to a a, a URL that is a, I guess as permanent as a URL can be uh that's a, it's a home for that report. Okay, just wanted to get that in there. Um, and then Mary Morrison had a second part for her question. Also, did you look at other factors in your study, or did you focus on the hydrologic pattern? We we really did focus on on the hydrologic fact, the, the hy hydrology, but we looked at that from from a bunch of different angles. I mean, we uh, we looked we cored trees on the spillway and looked for signs that the spillway had been altered. We uh, looked at the internal drain of the pond and, and, and uh, for, for any signs that it might have been uh, filled in. Uh, we did a, a land use uh, study for mirror photographs going back in, in the, to the 1940s and showed that uh, the, the only land use change had been an increase in forest cover in the, in the pond's basin, which would have probably had a tendency to dry it out. Uh, there was a deer exclusion study uh, that was going on at the same time because the deer population uh, on, on, on the Arnold Air Force uh, Base natural area had expanded, and we were able to show, convince ourselves that, that the seedlings inside the deer exclusion plot had no better chance of living than, than, than outside. Um, other, other than that, uh, no, we, we those, but those, yeah, that's about the range of, of uh, the hypotheses that we examined. Okay, I have no other questions stacked up, so here's your last chance for anyone to ask any questions, or uh, otherwise we'll wrap up. I'll give you a few more seconds to start a chat. This is Emily. I just want to say thanks so much, everybody, for the presentation and the great questions, and we really appreciate it. Thank you.